I know what people say about the government. The guy in front of me at the DMV, he says, everyone ought to be fired. My own brother, he wants to know what I like most about my job, the paper shuffling or the red tape. But after Katrina blew in 10 years ago and brought New Orleans to her knees, I've got a crazy proposition that government post-Katrina has been a disruptive force for good. That's right. I said the government. A disruptive force for good. Usually when we talk about Disruption, it's in economics, and it's usually some new technology. Think about Uber and Airbnb disrupting markets around the globe. Netflix shut down Blockbuster, and Amazon.com put borders out of business. The personal computer destroyed, crushed the typewriter. So usually, government is on the receiving end of revolutionary change and sudden change. But after Katrina, something totally different happened. Government was in the driver's seat, pushing tough, disruptive, innovative change. Now, I can see people's eyes rolling out there already. Because after all, Katrina, not exactly government's finest moment. Being abandoned by the federal government in Katrina's aftermath, that was rock bottom. And having to fight and scrape and beg for the money we, re we needed to rebuild just added insult to injury. And yet, when we finally got the money, that was government's finest moment. You know, we could have taken the path of least resistance, but we changed everything. As Mayor Landrieu often says, Katrina didn't create our problems. It just exposed them, and it called us to purpose, all of us to purpose, especially the government. That's what Governor Blanco was thinking when she proposed taking over the New Orleans schools. Talk about disruptive. That was the biggest. President Bush called it the greatest act of political courage. Because you see, Governor Blanco had a lot of strong support from folks like the teachers' unions. And they certainly didn't see Katrina as a reason to take over the schools, failing or not. And they were failing. In New Orleans, pre-Katrina, our schools were the academically worst performing in the state. Two-thirds of our students were in failing schools. And leadership? How about 10 superintendents in nine years? Corruption? The FBI was hot on the trail of ghost employees and school board members taking bribes. Things had gotten so bad that a high school valedictorian could not walk across the stage and get her diploma because she was unable to pass the state's graduate exit exam. Still, the governor received a barrage of phone calls, meeting requests from her friends, her supporters, the people who elected her, saying, just reopen the schools. Send the kids back to their same school, the teachers back to their same jobs. And that would have been the path of least resistance. But there were other people pounding on the governor's door, too. Most notably, state school board member Leslie Jacobs, state superintendent Cecil Picard. They insisted that if we followed the same path, we'd get the same results. More failure, more dropouts. At that moment, Governor Blanco chose to jump into the breach. She said no to the status quo if it meant our kids kept getting the short end of the stick. Change was going to come. Now, change was disruptive. It was tough. 
And nobody knew that more than the school, the school teachers who lost their jobs. And so as government takes disruption, disruptive action in the future, we can and should do better. But we carved out a new path, and that new path replaced a failing school district with a system of charter schools. And the results, transformational. The fastest academic growth anywhere in the country. Dropout rates going down, test scores going up, graduation rates going up, the achievement gap virtually eliminated. One day soon, this city, our city, will be the first in the country, the first urban district in the country without a single failing school. So school, the school takeover was the first disruptive action the government took for good, but it wasn't the only. The next area that needed reform was our public housing. Pre-Katrina, our residents in public housing lived in concentrated poverty in dangerous public housing developments. Residents with jobs were few. Crime and violence were high. Living conditions, substandard. The Louisiana Recovery Authority offered up federal rebuilding funds for public housing, but only, only if they were used to rebuild something completely different. Mixed income, multifamily, high quality apartments and houses. You know, the status quo would have been the easy path. Just rebuild what was there. National advocacy groups came in and joined the fight, leading protests. A congressional oversight hearing and a city council meeting were standing room only with protesters. Cynics, the developers, shrugged their shoulders. Said, in New Orleans, mixed income housing will never work. But New Orleanians were not going back. The city council didn't blink. They took measure of their constituents and with courage unanimously voted to demolish and completely change our public housing, rebuilding the big four, Columbia Park, Faubourg Lafitte, Marrero Commons, Harmony Oaks. The results, transformational. New Orleans replaced dangerous concentrations of poverty with mixed income communities. Families who lived in public housing before Katrina were first on the list to come home, and they are now anchors in their neighborhoods. Public health was also ripe for disruptive change in New Orleans. Who remembers the 1930s? Anybody out there? That was our model, invented by Huey Long. Now, don't get me wrong. Charity Hospital welcomed everyone. And the staff there, the doctors, the nurses, the techs, were as caring as they were talented. But the model was outdated. It was tired. It was expensive. And it was anything but patient-centered. Healthcare was rationed based on how sick you were or how long you were willing to wait in line. But the bureaucrats who ran the system were comfortable with the status quo and didn't want to change. And certainly, rebuilding the system as it was would have been an easier path. Across America, healthcare had been changing, though, decentralizing focusing on giving patients access to care and choice of providers. Local agitators, led by Dr. Karen DeSalvo, who was then a Tulane dean and later the city's health commissioner, asked the federal government to invest $100 million to set up a rival system. The leadership at the public hospitals wanted that money, too. But the government, this time, the federal government 
opted to take the more difficult path and fund 70 clinics that now serve 59,000 people in their neighborhoods. The results, again, transformational. No more expensive emergency, visits, emergency room visits, no more long lines, but cost-effective preventive and primary care near your house. We kept going. The next area I want to talk about where we turned government on its head was with the city of New Orleans. When Mayor Landry took office five years ago, experts called the city the most corrupt and dysfunctional government they had ever seen. City Hall was only open four days a week. Yep. But we were still hurtling towards bankruptcy. The citizens, and some of you were laughing just then, the citizens had all but given up on us. Right? So we transformed everything, everything. We made tough cuts and reorganizations that reversed the city's fiscal decline and kept us from bankruptcy. We threw out the old, stale economic development agency and replaced it with a private-public partnership that brought in new jobs and retail. We literally and figuratively knocked down the walls of City Hall to create a streamlined 311 system and a new one-stop shop for permitting. These are among the best in the country. We, we combined two agencies in the city, knocking down more walls to fight blight, and pioneered a first-in-the-country strategy of transferring blighted property to new owners through sheriff's auctions. And we're remediating blight faster than anyone in the country. 15,000 units demolished or rebuilt in the last five years. And we've completely re-engineered the City Assisted Evacuation Program, partnering with nonprofits, Evacuteer, and the Arts Council, so everybody knows to go to symbols like that if they need to get picked up for an evacuation. As the mayor says, our job is to do what is hard for the sake of doing what is right. We run to the fires. So when he announced that it was his highest priority to end the killing of young African-American men and boys on the streets of New Orleans, people said it couldn't be done, wasn't possible. Well, we created NOLA for Life, and last year, brought our homicide rate to the lowest amount in 43 years. It can be done. <laughs> Lastly, we got our recovery unstuck. We've wrested over a billion dollars of new money from FEMA in the last five years. The biggest capital budget is going on in the city's history. We're rebuilding to elevation, with hurricane protection, and developing new strategies to live with the water that surrounds our coastal city, facing head-on the challenges of climate change. That's the point. The mayor says, we're not rebuilding the city we had. We're creating the city we always should have had, we always should be. But it hasn't been easy. The governmental transfer transformations that you've seen post-Katrina were not inevitable. They took hard work. In fact, they were highly unlikely. The status quo is much easier. But today, New Orleans is on a roll. But a lot of that roll has been uphill. And you all know this. To roll uphill takes a powerful force at your back. And post-Katrina, in New Orleans, government has been that powerful, disruptive force for good. Thank you.